Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. And I, I really believe I have an important message to share today. I, I just really have... It was one of those messages that was hard to get exactly what God wanted to say. But I do believe I do have what God wants to say, hopefully. Um, this is one of those messages where, like Angie mentioned... I am preaching to myself, so I'm inviting you to watch me preach to myself. It's one of those messages where I need what I'm going to say very badly, and I'm sure all of us do, but I especially do, so I'm not preaching in any way as if I'm living it fully or as if I've arrived, but as if one who desperately needs this message as well. So I just want to clarify that because... I feel challenged by the Lord, and I like the challenges of God, because God only wants the very best for us. We need to be challenged by the Lord. I believe we've entered into a season where the challenge of the Lord is coming to us, and we have been uh, speaking for several weeks about the need for the body of Christ to grow up. You know, Paul said to the church of Ephesus, he said, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by every wind and wave of doctrine, but we are to grow up. There is the word of the Lord coming to the church right now, and the Lord is calling us to grow up. I like what Mike Bickle says, is while most of the church is waiting to go up in the rapture, God is wanting the church to grow up unto the head, Jesus Christ. This is an hour where we need to grow up. And the writer of Hebrews speaks to us in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. And he's saying, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, I like what he says here, let us press on to maturity. And when you really dig into the Greek word here, what this word press on to, what it really means is, it means that there are burdens that you are carrying. There are burdens that are on your shoulders. And that despite the weight that is on your shoulders, even though there's things you are carrying in your life, and all of us are carrying these things in our life. In fact, I feel sometimes bad as a pastor speaking challenging messages to people who are going through such trials. I do. So the, the, you know, so have you ever seen those cartoons where there's like an angel on one shoulder and a devil on another shoulder and the angel saying, do what God wants, and the devil saying, do what the devil wants? And anyway, sometimes inside of me, the pastor side of me is like, okay, you shouldn't really be speaking like that. And the prophet inside of me is saying, okay, be quiet, Mr. Rogers. You, they need the truth. And then the pastor inside of me is going, oh, who do you think you are, John the Baptist? And the pastor, or the prophet inside of me is, well, you've turned into hyper grace. So anyway, there's this whole conflict of pastor prophet going on inside of me. And, uh, but the writer of Hebrews is addressing this very issue. He's basically saying, I know that you have weights. I know that you are carrying things on your shoulders. I know there are trials and there are tribulations you're going through. Yet in spite of that, carrying those weights, you are to move forward. That's what that means. Despite the trials and the tribulations that you are encountering, you know, whether it's a physical ailment, whether it's, uh, you know, something going on in your house or in your relationships or with your children or at your work or in your ministry, whatever it would be, there are challenges that we are, that we are encountering. There is weights that we are carrying. There are things that are on our shoulders. And the writer of Hebrews says, in spite of that, carrying those weights and those burdens, you're to move forward towards maturity. And that's the call of the Lord upon us, is we are to press on to maturity. We're to press on to maturity no matter how we feel, no matter what we're going through, no matter the tribulations or the trials, no matter what it is we're encountering, the Lord is saying to us, press on to maturity. 
It's the word of the Lord, I believe, to the body of Christ. What the Spirit of God is saying to the church, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. And Paul says that we grow up by speaking the truth in love. See, if we speak the truth without love, it'll just bring condemnation, guilt, shame, and death. If, we sp if all we do is show love without the truth, it will lead into compromise, lawlessness, and all kinds of uh, immorality and, co and compromise, leading us away from the Lord. But the truth spoken in love leads to the body of Christ growing up unto maturity. And so we need the truth spoken. We need the truth spoken into our hearts. And anyway, what we've been looking at over the past several weeks is some things that keep us from growing up, some things that keep us from maturity. We looked at embracing another Jesus. We talked about that a few weeks ago. We talked last week or last time I preached about offense and familiarity. Those things keep us from maturing. Those things keep us from growing up. This week, we're going to look at negligence. Negligence. How negligence keeps us from growing up. The scriptures highlight at least three areas that, that address the issue of negligence. Negligence, we can neglect our salvation. We can neglect the word of God. And we can neglect the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now let's talk first about neglecting our salvation. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Hebrews 2, verse 3. The writer of Hebrews says, How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now let me just say this. The writer of Hebrews is addressing the church. He's not addressing unbelievers. He did not say, if you reject so great a salvation, how shall we escape? That's what he would say to unbelievers. He said, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Believers have not rejected salvation but believers can neglect salvation. See, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He's speaking to believers. He's speaking to the church. And he's saying, how are you going to escape the judgment seat of Christ if you neglect so great a salvation? Now, we neglect, how, how do we neglect, or, or what does it mean to neglect? It's, it means to be careless. It means to regard our salvation as minor and trivial. It means that we, if, if we're careless, it means we really care less. See, how many in the church think of their salvation as so minor and so trivial, and instead of seeing how great a salvation has been given to us. And the writer of Hebrews wants to exhort us, how are you going to escape standing before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, saved in heaven, but having neglected your salvation and all your works burned by the fire? I don't want that to happen to myself. I really don't. I fear the judgment seat of Christ in a healthy way so much, and I hope you do too. If we lived our lives in the light of the judgment seat of Christ, we would live so very differently. There is coming a day for every born-again believer when you are going to stand before Jesus Christ. Now, if you're getting convicted, let me just say this. As a leader and as a teacher, my judgment seat experience is going to be far worse than yours. All right? So, if you're not a leader, you've got it good. But we, we still are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
and his eyes of fire are going to look up and down our entire lives, penetrating the deepest part of who we are. And I would rather judge myself now rather than be judged then. In fact, that's what Paul said. Judge yourself so that you are not judged. Paul, in speaking about the judgment seat of Christ, said, knowing the terror of the Lord. There is a fear of God that is absent from the modern day church. We have, we don't fear God like we used to. We want to snuggle in Papa's lap and drink our Starbucks coffee by singing Kumbaya to the great judge of the universe. We've lost the fear of God. Now, that does not mean we can't be intimate with the Father and call him Abba, Father, and draw near. That does not mean that at all. In fact, if we have the true fear of God, we'll draw near to God instead of away from God. But this idea that we have of God where we can just you know, cuddle up in his lap and treat him like Santa Claus and tell him what we want for Christmas is absolutely foreign to the scriptures. And so the writer of Hebrews is asking us a pointed question. How are we going to escape the eyes of fire who are going to evaluate our life, evaluate our motives, evaluate our ambitions, evaluate the very driving, pulsating desires of our heart? Why we did what we did. How are we going to escape that if we neglect so great a salvation? If we don't regard the salvation that God has done inside of us, the work God's done inside of us, the incredible things that God has done inside of us. If you're born of the Spirit, you have been recreated entirely your spirit is exactly like jesus christ ephesians 4 24 made into his likeness and his righteousness complete your spirit has been made into his image you are like jesus in your spirit having that encounter having that born again experience where now your spirit is now joined to the holy spirit the writer of hebrews asks us how are you going to escape if you neglect that? If you keep living out of your own body, out of your own soul, instead of from your born-again spirit, how are you going to escape the judgment of the Lord? See, so many Christians today, having Christ live in them, are living from the soul. Soulish Christians. Carnal Christians living from the cravings of their body. That's why what Angie said earlier is we need a, a Hebrews 4.12, the sword of the Spirit coming to pierce into the very core of our heart, down to the very fibers and the separation of soul and spirit, getting to the, the, the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. How I want that. Some people don't want that. I want it. I love it. I do. It doesn't feel great at the time. But man, I love the sharpness of God's word. I love the penetration of God's word into my heart and showing me, oh, that's what I'm doing. I don't want to live without the illumination of God's word. I don't want to live not seeing what's really driving me and moving me. See, Paul told the Corinthians, he said, you're acting like mere men. That's a profound statement. As a new creation in Christ, with God the Holy Spirit living inside of you, with Christ living inside of you, he looked at them and he said, you have jealousy and you have strife in your midst. Your heart has been corrupted by jealousy and strife. And you're acting like mere men. What was happening? They were neglecting their salvation. They were living as if they were a normal Corinthian off the street. And Paul looks at him and he says, Don't you know 
Don't you know you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? God, the creator of the universe, dwells inside of you. And you're living from your brain. You're living from the impulses of your body, the five senses. You're living from what your soul wants and craves. You're acting like a mere man or a woman of the old creation. They were neglecting their salvation. Now, if you look in our notes on page two, do you have notes? Okay. Well, you can't look in your notes on page two. But I will tell you... What is in your notes on page 2? <clears throat> if you do a careful study of the book of Hebrews, you're going to see a progression. You're going to see a progression that in Hebrews 2.1, negligence leads to drifting. When we don't regard what God has done, when we don't care and we don't really take it serious, what God has done inside of us, when we lose divine seriousness... It leads to this subtle drift. They say that a plane flying from New York to Los Angeles, if it is off course by one degree, will end up, I think, 40 miles into the ocean. That small little drift that you probably don't even recognize will eventually lead you off course. And it's rooted in negligence. It's rooted in not caring. See, how much do we care about what God has done inside of us? See, we need to be challenged. I need to be challenged. I don't want to neglect my salvation at all. See, drifting, when we begin to drift just one degree off course, what begins to happen that we see in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 5.11 and 6.12, is drifting leads to dullness of hearing and sluggishness. That word in the Greek is actually the same word. Is we become dull of hearing, we become sluggish. Sluggish is, is like, you know how the way you feel on Thanksgiving when you eat so much turkey and so much uh, dressing and all the different stuff you feel... I mean, you cannot move for the next day and probably the day after. I mean, you are just stuck in a chair. You know, just you can't even do anything. That's like sluggish. You can't move. You can't do anything. You can barely talk. All you want to do is sleep. See, so many Christians have become like that. They're fed with so much of the world and even knowledge from the Scriptures that they have become sluggish. They have become apathetic. They have become indifferent. That... They, their hearing, their capacity to hear God speak has now grown dull. That's why Jesus always said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's why he said, hearing they cannot hear, seeing they cannot see. God save us from being like that. Dullness of hearing. I don't want to have a dull heart. I don't want to be in this slumber, in this sluggishness, in this fog where the word of the Lord to me, I can't receive because I'm dull. Much of the church today is dull of hearing. Much of the church today is sluggish. God would challenge us out of the sluggishness. God would challenge us out of the dullness of hearing because dullness and sluggishness leads to unbelief. So the writer of Hebrews says, Take care, my brethren. He's speaking to the church. My brethren, take care. There's an urgency from him. Take care, my brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. We are witnessing in the church the beginning of the great falling away. It's happening. They didn't just get there overnight. They got there because of negligence, leading to drift leading to dullness of hearing, leading to sluggishness, 
leading to unbelief. Take care, my brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God. Lord, help us. Help us not to neglect so great a salvation. Let's turn in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. Acts chapter 6, verse 2. This is very much a, something the, the American church needs to hear. The disciples, what was going on is the, the, the service of ministry began to increase and the need to take care of the poor began to increase. And the apostles saw this from a distance and they said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the Word of God. See, the second area of negligence is neglecting the Word of God. I heard a story by a pastor in Hawaii, and this pastor, he went to China to do leadership training. And he was saying that there was about 22 leaders in the Chinese church that came into this hotel for leadership training. 17 of them had been in prison. And as he's passing out Bibles to the crowd or to the leaders, he realizes he only has 17. So he realizes, okay, five are going to have to go, out, go without a Bible. And he notices one of the ladies takes the Bible and hands it to somebody else. They're looking at, I think, somewhere in 1 Peter. And he realizes this lady has memorized the entire chapter of 1 Peter. And he goes and he starts asking her, okay, what did, what did you do? I mean, you know, I know you've been to prison. And she said, yes, in prison, we cannot take the Bible in and we can't take any Christian material in. But what we can do is we can take the, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ will write the scriptures down on sheets of paper and we'll memorize entire books of the Bible because prison guards and prison, you know, the prison system cannot take away what is written inside of our heart. They might be able to take the word of God away, but they cannot take what is written inside of our heart. May that awaken the American church. We've got leather-bound Bibles. We've got Bibles in every translation known to man. We've got Bibles on our iPads and our iPhones. We've got Bibles on our computers. We've got every version of Bibles. We've got Bibles everywhere, and yet we rarely even open them to read them. I know that's not everyone, but I have been increasingly burdened about this in the American church is the amount of biblical illiteracy in the church today. Not knowing the scriptures for yourself. See, you don't need to... See, God is... When you stand before the Lord, He is not going to say, this excuse is not going to hold up before Him. Well, this is what Brian taught me. Or this is what Ken taught me. Or this is what this person taught me. Or that person taught me. The Lord is going to be like, I, you have every version of the Bible you could ever want. And you never even opened it to study the scriptures. Come on. That needs to awaken us a little bit. How can we, not, how can we neglect the word of God? We, I mean... The first century church didn't even have a New Testament. And they're talking about the Old Testament. They, you know, the apostles were saying, we're, we don't want to neglect the Old Testament. I mean, how much better is the New Covenant? How much more should we be in the Scriptures, Old and New Covenant, but especially the New Covenant? Don't neglect the Word of God. I've made a lot of dumb decisions in my life. Ask Angie. One of the dumbest decisions I ever made was when we were going to celebrate our honeymoon and I showed up <laughs> at the hotel and I packed our, my luggage in a black garbage bag. And she's thinking, what on earth are you doing? I have no, I, to this day, I have no idea what on earth I was even thinking. I mean, what was I thinking? I don't I just too cheap to get luggage or I don't I have no idea what I was even thinking but 
I show up and we're, 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 you know, we're spending the first night at the Waverly Hotel, a really nice hotel. I show up and the, the bellman takes our, our luggage, her nice luggage in my black garbage sack. And she's like, dear God, who have I married? I, I still, honestly, I still have no idea. No clue what I was thinking. I remember another time was we had just gotten our puppy, Winston, and, you know, it was, I think it was probably the first time I've really had to take care of a dog, and the puppy was in the kitchen. All I remember is waking up every single morning, and then there's being pee stains and poop smells every morning. I was like, God, I can't, I, I cannot handle this anymore. I said, Angie, I'm going to go get him a crate or a fence or whatever, and she thought I was going to get him a, a crate. I said, I'm going to go get him a crate to put him in. I just can't take this anymore. We just got to put them in the garage. I can't handle this. And so anyway, you know, she's thinking one of those crates that go into a room. And I, show, and I come back home and I said, they're going to be delivering the, the fence in a f- couple hours. So I, get a f- I bought a fence, I mean literally a fence the entire size of one side of a garage. And she, they show up like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You brought an entire fence into our garage, and, you know, poor little Winston is in one little corner. I mean, he could have easily fit in a crate. Anyway, dumb decision. I've made so many dumb decisions. I'll spare you from the rest, but there's so many more I could say. And if you want to know some of the other dumb ones, ask my brothers or my dad. They'll gladly tell you. But one of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my entire life is devoting myself to the Word of God. At a young age... I said to myself, I am going to know the scriptures. I am going to study the scriptures like there's no tomorrow. I am going to plant this word into my heart. I'm going to learn about every book. I mean, not every book, but I'm going to go deep in the scriptures. And I can tell you 20 years later, looking back, planting the word in my heart is, the be- is probably one of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my life. Now, I want to say if you're young, if you're 30 Five, let's say if you're 40 and younger, I want to encourage you, go deep in God's Word. Don't neglect God's Word. There are so many tools you can use if you're busy in your car, driving, exercising, mowing the grass, whatever, of getting the Word of God inside of you. Just go on a journey that will take you deep in the Word of God. It will not come back void. I assure you, what you plant in your heart of God's word, you will see the harvest of five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years later, all throughout eternity. For all of eternity, you will live in the ripple effect of the planting of God's word into your heart. James said, plant, or James said, the implanted word, receive the implanted word. It's not just reading the word, it's not just studying the word, but it's getting the word in your heart. That word in your heart is able to save your soul. The word of God in his own inherent power has the natural capability and ability to transform and save your soul. The work we have to do is clear the clutter from our heart and plant that word so deep inside of us that it gets lodged into our heart. And then the word of God says, it by itself will begin to spring up fruit. And I have seen this over my life. And I just makes me want to go deeper and deeper into God's word. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter 22. The next area of neglect that affects many believers, probably more than anything, is neglecting the invitation to the wedding feast. One of Jesus' last messages before the cross, he's speaking to the public. One of his last public messages, the Lord is unveiling his eternal purpose, the purpose that was created before time and creation that God the Son would have an equally yoked bride who would be his wife for all of eternity. That was the very purpose that drove the Godhead. And he said the kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. It's all about the marriage to the Lamb of God. But now notice and let this, let this pierce us. Verse 5. Here's how some of the people responded to the invitation. They paid no attention. They were careless. That word actually means neglect. They neglected it. Here's the Son of God in the flesh standing before them, the bridegroom God from eternity, unveiling God's eternal purpose in the flesh, inviting the world into the very reason why they were created. And they paid no attention. They neglected it. They didn't care about it. They didn't have concern about it. And because of that lack of concern, they went their way. They went their way, not his way, not Yahweh. They followed their own destiny at the expense of the Lamb's destiny. One to his farm and another to his business. They neglected the wedding invitation. See, neglecting the wedding invitation is demonstrated not by what we desire, but what we do. Neglect is illustrated by how we spend our time. Now, I mentioned earlier that this is now, this is the third year anniversary of the passing of our spiritual father, noble man from Australia. And so many things about his life deeply impacted me, but one stands above it all. And it was his, his divine seriousness related to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't think I've ever seen anyone more focused than noble man about this calling. I remember in 1996, in my 20s, being in Australia, staying at Noel's house, and Noel would lock himself away for hours, seeking the Lord. It wasn't legalistic. It wasn't driven by, you know, this, this condemnation or any of that. It was driven by the vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That, that invitation drove Noel. I remember just seeing him come back from walks and he had his hat. His, well, I forget the name of the exact name of the hat, but his Australian hat that he would walk in. And you could just tell, I mean, he had been with the Lord. I mean, he was seeking the Lord so fervently. He had this... These eyes, the eyes of the prophet. If you ever remember seeing Noel's eyes, they were just so penetrating. But it came from this vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I just, I want that. I don't have it quite like Noel has or even close to what Noel has. I want that. That is what drove Noel to spend time with the Lord. See, if we try to say, okay, you need to spend more time with Jesus and we don't have the vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb, then we're going to see, okay, well, Noel spent six hours or eight hours a day seeking the Lord. And we're going to try to copy him without the vision. It's going to create burnout in like a week or three days or one day. You can't copy what Noel did. But... Maybe God might impart to us that vision, that care that burned inside of him, that caused him. It was the vision that Noel had. It was the vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It was that vision to prepare a bride and for him to be prepared himself. It was that vision that moved Noel to 
order his entire life and the way he spent his time and the way he spent his money ordered around the heavenly vision, the heavenly calling, the high heavenly calling of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is what drove Noel to his intimacy with the Lord, his love and his passion for Jesus. See, I, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about, you know, from this message, you need to go out and spend four hours every day seeking God. Now, the Lord might lead you to that, that's, but that's not what I'm saying in this message. I'm not talking about neglecting a quiet time. I'm not ne talking about neglecting, you know, maybe this week you didn't spend time with the Lord. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about neglecting the destiny that God has for you. I'm talking about the destiny that you have been invited into. I'm talking about not being, uh, taking it with divine seriousness, the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what I'm talking about. See, I, I think so. I think here's the issue here, and I'm gonna. I'll get, I'll, actually, I'll get into this in the next point. The five foolish virgins, or I like what Dad says, the five foolish Christians, is a great example of neglecting the wedding invitation. In fact, the word in the Greek for foolish primarily denotes dull or sluggish, and that dullness and sluggishness leads to foolishness. See, the foolish virgins didn't just make stupid decisions. There was something deeper inside of the foolish virgins that caused them to make decisions that were not wise. It was they had first become dull. It was first they had become sluggish. It was first that they had grown dull of heart, dull of hearing, sluggish, apathetic, indifferent. And that indifference then, that sluggishness, that dullness of heart is what caused them and moved them to not pay the price to purchase oil in the secret place. And that's what made them foolish. But it started with the dullness of heart. It started with a sluggishness here deep inside. It started with a neglect of the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. May the Lord reawaken in me. And may the Lord reawaken in you that high heavenly calling, the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is no greater destiny for us. There is no greater calling than to be married to the Lamb for all of eternity. Let us rejoice and be glad for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Oh, God, I want to be part of that. Oh, God, I don't want to miss that. Give me oil for my lamp. Put a fear of the Lord inside of me. Put inside of me this divine seriousness that would drive me to order my life like a wise virgin. Who, who purchases oil in the secret place. This week I listened to Leonard Ravenhill. Drew had sent me one of his messages from, I don't even know what year it was done. As I was listening to Leonard Ravenhill, I was thinking, my, I had no idea. He preaches just like Noel. You want to, you know, if you've never heard Noel preach, go listen to a Leonard Ravenhill message it, it was just like they're brothers. You know, Leonard Ravenhill is one of the great men of God of, this, of the past recent uh, years. You know, he's very popular, but, you know, God sent us our own version of that in Noel Man. I mean, they preached almost identical. The same spirit of Elijah was on both of them. The same accent and the same divine seriousness was on them. And it was just like... So I was just so moved by that. Now, I do have to admit that I turned it off to listen to Sports Talk Radio just for a minute because I had to hear this report, all right? So I don't want to come across as ultra super spiritual. I did turn it off, all right, just for like 15 or 20 minutes to listen to this report. But it moved me so deeply, so, so deeply enough I turned it to Sports Radio. But I'm going to go back and listen to it. 
it was so powerful. It just stirred up in me like, God, we've got, we've got to have that again. These men of God, we want to become that, not just look at their lives and say, wow, such great men of God. We want to become that ourselves. We want to become a corporate expression of that. Not just one or two people, but the entire body being like that. Now let's look back to Matthew 22, verse 5. I want you to see here, when they paid no attention, they didn't regard the invitation with seriousness, with divine seriousness. They, they went to their farm, one to his farm, and one to his business. The issue here is not about how much time do you spend with Jesus, the issue here is what destiny is pulsating in your heart. That's the issue. And that brings me to point number five. The fifth thing that can lead us, that can keep us immature, is pursuing our own destiny. See, what's going on really in the hearts of those who paid no attention, what's going on is there was another destiny inside of them competing there was another destiny, even a, even a God-given destiny that's, that's lower than the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Even a destiny for ministry, even a destiny for God-anointed business, even a destiny to have a great, blessed family. Those things that are good can compete with the ultimate of God's very best and highest, the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, what happened here... In Matthew 22, what's going on is Jesus is offering the invitation, but yet what's taking root inside of them is another destiny, their own destiny, and not the Lamb's destiny. There's a lot of talk in the body of Christ today about your destiny that's completely disconnected from God's eternal purpose, has nothing to do with it. I believe God's targeting that false teaching, disconnected from God's eternal purpose in this hour. It's leading multitudes astray from the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because their destiny is placed above the Lamb's destiny. Jeremiah Johnson, I was listening to him preach recently, and Jeremiah Johnson was saying that they were doing a prophetic conference where they were teaching about signs and wonders and they were giving prophetic words and they were doing all these different things and they were doing all these kind of outward signs and the first night of the meeting they had 500 people in attendance. After that meeting, or at the end of that meeting, he said, okay, tomorrow we're going to focus on prayer, holiness, and consecration. 50 people showed up. See, the body of Christ is addicted to wanting their own destiny. We want our destiny to be fulfilled. So we're going to go seek out the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the prophetic words. Now, I'm not against prophecy or signs and wonders or any of that. What I'm trying to hit on is the driving, pulsating desire inside of us. That's what I'm trying to hit on. That's what I'm trying to get at, is what are we living for? Ask yourself that question. What is it? What are you living for? Ask yourself. Are you living? Is your passion to have a good family? Is your passion to have a successful business? Is your passion to have an influential ministry? Is your passion to make money? Is your passion to be blessed? Is that what is driving you? Is that what is moving you? What is that passion? What is that purpose that drives what you do? Because I have found this out. Whatever we li are living for, we will make time for. You want to get real focused, you can evaluate how much time you're spending with the Lord and you can evaluate that and look at the fruit of it and realize is the marriage supper of the Lamb really what is driving my life? 
There's an idol in the church of Jesus Christ today that's called destiny. And a lot of preachers and teachers and prophetic voices today are speaking right into the, the idols of the hearts of those in the congregations. I just did a quick internet search of some of the most popular books and TV programs and things like that from some of the most influential people in the body of Christ. And let me just share with you some of the titles. Your Best Life, Your Best Life Now, Be an Exceptional You, How to Be Happier, Every day is a Friday. Your best is yet to come. How to have a successful and abundant life. See, what's happening is there's idols in the hearts of God's people for their own destiny at the expense of God's destiny. They want their best life now. They want their best life now. And so what God, it even talks about this in Ezekiel chapter 14 I will send prophets to them, and the prophets will speak to them based on their idols. Scary. 1 Kings 22, Micaiah is the prophet of the Lord. He sees a vision, and he sees before the throne of God a deceitful spirit that goes into the mouth of the prophets as a deceiving spirit because they did not want to hear the true word of the Lord. The deception that is going on in this nation where influential leaders are giving people and they're speaking right to the idols of their heart, right into their destiny, and they're giving them exactly what they want to hear. I believe we're entering into a time when the Lord is pronouncing judgment on that, just like he did in Ezekiel chapter 14, where he's saying, I am holding guilty both the prophet and the inquirer. Isaiah 65, let's turn to Isaiah 65. Isaiah chapter 65. Verse 11 is a, is a now word for the body of Christ. But you, I believe the Lord would speak this to the body of Christ. I believe it would just not even pertain to us here, but around the world, that the word of the Lord to the church is but you who forsake the Lord. You forget Mount Zion. You forget my holy mountain. Why? You set a table for fortune and you fill cups with mixed wine for destiny. That describes the modern day church in America and around the world. We are living for money and for destiny. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe God blesses us I believe God blesses us with prosperity. I believe God blesses our families. I believe God anoints us and to do different things like have a good business or an influential ministry and all that. I believe in all of that and I want all of that. I'm hitting at the driving, pulsating desire in our heart that moves us, that shapes how we spend our time and our energy, how, it's, how we spend our money. They forsake the Lord and God's holy mountain, Mount Zion, Hebrews 12, Revelation 4, 1 through 5. They forsake the high heavenly calling of God to have intimacy with the Lord. They forsake him for money and for destiny. You who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain. Man, can we hear that? May God raise up. May God raise up a people who would value and take to heart the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb far above our own destiny. You've got prophets running around the country and you've got people flocking to the prophetic conferences wanting a word. Prophesy a word to me. And just like Ezekiel 14 says, I will raise up a prophet 
and they will speak to you according to the idols of, their, of your own heart. I see the Lord opening up doors of financial prosperity for you. I see the Lord opening up doors of ministry for you. I see the Lord opening up all these different things. Now, I'm not saying God never does that because he does do that. What I'm hitting at is the idols in the heart of destiny in the body of Christ in God's people that want their destiny apart from the Lamb's destiny. It is all about the Lamb's destiny. Can we get the church of Jesus Christ back to the Lamb's destiny and forsake our own destiny? and find our destiny in Him. I tell you, it will be far better than having a great business or an influential ministry or having a lot of money. Now, I'm not saying you, you can't have both. I'm not saying you can't. But I'm saying in terms of priority that the Lamb in His destiny, in His wedding, in His invitation would be the driving, pulsating vision of our heart. Let's... Let's turn to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11. It's when the bride, the Shulamite maiden, it's when the betrothed bride of Christ received a vision of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I'm speaking symbolically, it is when the bride saw the vision of Jesus Christ on his wedding day that she was moved to lay her life down. This is what it says in Song of Solomon. Go forth, daughters of Zion. Gaze on King Solomon. May God give us vision of King Jesus sitting on the throne as the bridegroom king. As the bridegroom king, may God give us vision of the bridegroom king on the day of his wedding. On the day of the gladness of his heart. If we could have that vision, if we could have that vision of him on that day of the gladness of, of his heart. That vision, that eternal driving vision of the Lamb of God on his wedding day, if that entered into our heart and we had divine seriousness related to the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb, if we had that, then we would have one chapter later in Song of Solomon 4, verse 16, where the bride finally comes to become the inheritance of her bridegroom where the bride can say boldly, Awake, north wind. Awake, even the trials and the tribulations. Awake, wind of the south, the blessings and the favor and the, and the, and the blessings of God upon us, the, the cool south breeze of the Holy Spirit. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruit, where now... We are not nearly as focused on our inheritance in Christ. We're focused on his inheritance in us. It's the vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb that drives that kind of life, that drives that kind of prayer. I'm convinced that unless we have that vision, unless we take with divine seriousness the wedding invitation to heart, with divine seriousness, I'm convinced we'll never be prepared. We'll never be prepared. Because we won't do what's necessary. If we try to do what's necessary without vision, we'll have burnout. That's why I'm trying to say we need the vision. We need the heavenly vision of the king on his wedding day, of the bridegroom king on his wedding day, on the gladness of his heart, because seeing him on his wedding day will move us and motivate us to be a wise virgin who gets oil. Amen. May God raise that up. See, we see the same thing in Luke 14. The Lord, this time, what happens is the people are living for another destiny and they begin to make excuses why they can't come. 
Again, the root issue is their, their, their destiny, their self-centered, selfishly ambitious destiny is driving them. And so therefore, they're making excuses of why they can't attend. Again, it's destiny. It's this issue of destiny that God is wanting to really point out. It's this issue of destiny. See, when any other destiny, whether it's having a, a blessed family. Now, again, God is into all of that. But I'm talking about the number one destiny of our heart. To have a blessed family or a beautiful home or success in business or influence in ministry. When that eclipses the destiny that God the Father offers to us to marry his son, that can keep us from the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because what we will do is we will go out to pursue our own destiny and we'll neglect the wedding invitation and then we'll make excuses for why we're living the way we're living. May God draw us back to his heart. May God awaken within us a high heavenly calling. I want to, I as we end this message, I want to pray for us. and Get this on the recording because I want to pray this for whoever would listen. I want to pray for us as we bring this to an end. I want to ask the Lord to take the life of noble man, that may it be like a seed. Jesus said that unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That his life as a seed, and I'm going to point out the one thing to me that stands out more than any other of Noel's life is his vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb and the divine seriousness that revolved around that vision that God would put that into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about anything we're trying to work up. I'm not talking about go out and, and try to live like Noel did and spend time with the Lord for eight hours a day or whatever it was, that you will burn out doing that. I'm talking about a Holy Spirit, God-breathed vision that is deposited into us by the grace of God that then becomes our own vision of the heavenly calling of the marriage supper of the Lamb that then moves and shapes us and, and is the very centerpiece around which we schedule our time and our energy and our money. So I'm going to pray that for us right now. Just receive that right now. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would just take Lord Noel's life, that faithful man of God, that lived before an audience of one for so many years when no one saw but you. I ask you, take his life as a seed, going into the ground buried, that it might now spring forth on this third year of his, the anniversary of his death. Like Dad mentioned in the, in the worship time, Jesus being dead in the, in the tomb for three days. Noel being dead for three years. There's significance to this, I believe. Just receive it. I, believe the, I feel the Lord on this right now. Just receive that. That, Lord, I ask you, take that seed of his life. Laid down into the ground his vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb that drove him, that shaped how he spent time and energy. Lord, I ask you that you would put into us, Lord, a divine seriousness, a, a holy regard and care. Lord, 
that we would regard Jesus on the day of his wedding as our ultimate destiny, that it would be greater than our own selfish destiny. Lord, even the good things you've called us to, like having a good family, a good home, a good ministry, a good business, and prospering, those would take second place, third place, tenth place to the ultimate destiny we have been called into. Lord, I am asking you to do a work of grace, Lord, in our hearts and my heart, and all who would listen to this message to their hearts as well, Lord. And I just want to encourage you, even if you're listening online, receive this prayer right now. Just receive this with us. Lord, that you would put into our hearts, Lord, divine seriousness centered around the marriage supper of the Lamb that would determine how we spend our money and our time and our life, I pray. The vision you granted your servant, Noel, of the wedding day that you might give it and multiply it on this day. And I ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We can end the recording now.